Mamas, don't let your kids grow up to be Pharisees. <laughs> is the title for today's sermon. <laughs> Did you know that God's hate is actually a product of his love? God sees the, the, what's going on in the world, the way we use people for our own gratification, the way somebody made in the image of God becomes a dollar sign to us or, or a way to satisfy ourselves sexually or, or somebody we can use to our advantage to get ahead or to make ourselves look popular or to hang around with the right people. And God looks down from heaven and says, I hate that because each person is made in my image. Each person is is wonderful and beautiful and, and made for a relationship with me. And anything that gets between ourselves and Almighty God, God hates it. He hates it because He loves us. God's hate uh, is a product of His love. Today we're going to look at eight woes in... Uh, not like, whoa, that's awesome, but like eight woes, like God says, uh, Jesus say, woe is the person who does this, and in, 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 it's horrible, agony, destruction will fall upon you because of these things, and, and so I'm true to form, this is the Mother's Day sermon, it's not as bad as a couple years ago when I chose Mother's Day to preach on hell, <laughs> but uh, it's what came next in the text, and Jesus Christ is going, he, he just goes off on the Pharisees. And this is God become flesh. God coming down to earth and God goes off on the religious people that are using religion in such a way that it keeps other people from knowing God. And when, as we read through this section, I want you to pay attention. Jesus Christ is saying, I hate it when, when religious people do this and I hate it when religious people do that and I, I hate it when religious people act this way. And you're going to be uncomfortable because it's the very same thing that non-Christians often say when they look at Christianity, they say, I don't like that about Christianity. I don't like that about religion. Now, I want us to be careful with that. Do not get your clues on how to be spiritual from the people who don't care about God and need to be saved because they're on a path that will lead in destruction. They're not spiritually more mature. Uh, they're not somebody you need to be going to for advice. But when their words echo God, and when God himself says, my name is blasphemed among the non-believers because of your behavior, that's the time to say, wait, wait, maybe, wait a second, maybe religious people have an, a tendency to do some things wrong. So there are, there are sins, if you're irreligious, there's sins to just <laughs> get into, but there are sins that are peculiar to religious people. They have to do with you using religion in a way God didn't intend it to. There are sin, sins that are particular to people that are, are doing the religious thing, that they can do it in such a way you can be religious and not have a relationship with God. Did you hear me? You can, you can go through religious ritual and routine and totally not see God whatsoever. In fact, you can be so far from God that your life, as you do the, the Bible study and the church thing, and you, you, though you go through the baptism and all the ceremonies, your life can be driving people away from God and God hates it because he loves you and he loves those people you're driving away from him. So eight woes. Uh, God's gripe against poorly organized religion. You, know, you always hear that. People say, I hate organized religion. Well, first, Jesus Christ died to establish the church. It's the Bible that gave us our outlines for what the church looked like. God calls us together to corporate worship. How did Jesus teach us to pray? First words, our, our, Father. our Father. That prayer is not meant to be done alone. We're supposed to be our Father. It's a group thing. And, you know, the flip side is I don't see your disorganized religion working very well either. Uh, but no, uh, it's not organized religion. It's poorly organized religion or sinfully organized religion. And these, by the way, these eight woes, these are the things that great moms, women of God, teach their children to avoid. Because mama, there ain't nobody prays like a praying mama. And mama 
who loves God and loves her kids does not want her kids to grow up to be Pharisees. Amen? Does not want her, her children to grow up and use religion to feel self-righteous and to look down at those people. And, and does everybody understand that sin is not a product of, a sin is not a product of skin color or, or social class or, or how much education you have or how much money you make? Moms, we don't want to be raising kids that are looking down at other people, and especially if they're using religion and Jesus Christ to do it. How, how, how wretched, and what a coup, what a victory for the fires of hell. Right? I mean, the boardroom of hell sitting around, look at this. They're using the name of Jesus Christ, driving people away from, from God, and feeling so self-righteous and religious about it, and we're going to meet him real soon. you know. And God says, I hate it, and is it any wonder he hates it? Because he loves us so much, he would actually take nails for us and have the sin and guilt and disgusting filth of an entire world dumped on him. And then we do stuff to drive people away from him? Of course he hates it. And Jesus Christ, God of flesh, is saying, woe to the person who does this and woe to the person who does that. The eight woes, God's gripe against poorly organized religion. And these are things parents... Don't let your kids grow up to be Pharisees. So we're in Matthew chapter 23. If you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's sermon yet, it is online. I really recommend it because we, we balance out. We show all the great things that God has in store for us, all the great promises, contrasted to what the Pharisees, what human-made religion was, was offering people. And it's such a fair trade. It's, a, it's, such a, it's such a poor trade. And God's saying, go after what I'm promising you. Go after what I have in store for you. Don't trade it all in for what the Pharisees offer. So chapter 23 of Matthew from verse 13. <clears throat> Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You religious guys. You say, woe to you, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You know what? Those people, you're thinking right now, well, why was Jesus so harsh with them? Why would Jesus talk so hard to them? They were so far gone that they were going to just, in, in all their pomp and ceremony and, and feeling so good about themselves, they were going to dance right into hell, and Jesus Christ needed to interrupt that dance. He says, you're a bunch of hypocrites, and woe to you. You better get this, otherwise you're doomed. The reason he was harsh with the Pharisees is not because he hated them, it's because he loved them and he wanted them to be with him in eternity. Woe to you, you teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Can we at least agree that we don't want to have a church that stops people from meeting Jesus? We don't want to have a church that keeps people away from heaven. But there can be a religion that's done in such a way. This is not me. This is Jesus Christ. You can do religion in such a way that it estranges people from God. It pushes people away from God. You yourselves do not enter. I thought everybody goes to heaven. No. No. Jesus is saying, you religious guys, you got a lot of religion. You're not going to make it. You yourselves do not enter. Nor will you let those who are trying to enter, enter in. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea. You turn over every stone. You're very ambitious. You're very religious. You're very passionate. You're very zealous, but zealousness without truth is very dangerous. Today in America, the word zeal is almost a bad word. So chill out. Don't be so zealous. Zealous is like people who blow themselves up. No, be zealous for love. Be zealous for other people's souls. Be zealous to, uh, to honor God. Be zealous about the right things. Be zealous about truth. But zeal without wisdom is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And Jesus says, you're very ambitious. You, you, you turn over every stone. You travel land. You travel sea just to win a single convert. And then you make that convert twice as much a child of hell as you are. And again, Jesus wasn't there to win a popularity contest. He was there to tell people you're going to hell. Woe to you, you better repent. You better get right with the Lord. Woe to you, you blind guides. He's real. Imagine being in that crowd that day. I think it was a little uncomfortable. Woe to you, you blind guides. You say, listen to this. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, 
it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, they are bound by their oath. You blind fools! Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But whoever sway, swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, if anyone swears by the altar, therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. Anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and every, and anyone who swears, excuse me. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and the one who sits in it. Stop being idiots. Well, that's not in the original, but that's understood. <laughs> Verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. Imagine that. These little spice seeds, and you're, you've got your tweezers or whatever, and you're, you're cutting away. In every tenth one, you're designating to God. You're giving a tenth of everything you own to God, even down to the spices. You hypocrites, you're giving a tenth of everything. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So being meticulous to give to God, Jesus actually puts a stamp of approval on that. Yeah, give your tenth. But you should have practiced these greater issues. Don't just stop. I wrote my check this week, put, cash it in. Now I don't have to care about God. I don't have to care about other people. And you think God is pleased with that? Keep your money, let it rot in your pockets. Love God, love other people. Care about the great issues that God cares about. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Pour in some tea, got a strainer there, you don't want the gnat to get in there. You accidentally dump a camel in there and you drink it. Jesus is saying, you are totally missing it. You think you're being religious, you are totally, totally, you're so, we got the gnat out, everybody. <laughs> Choking on that camel. It's possible to do religion. Hello, people. It's possible to do religion in such a way that you totally miss the point. Being religious it ain't so special in God's eyes. Woe, woe, woe to you. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Uh, has anybody noticed a theme yet? God's not really big on hypocrisy, is he? Pretending like we're something we're not. That's why we don't want to be a church when you're put on this false mask. You, you come to church, we all, we're all so spiritual here. We're all so perfect. You're perfect, I'm perfect. Let's look down at other people. <laughs> they struggle with sins, we don't. Doesn't that make you feel good? I don't want to be in that church. Actually, I love you guys so much, I don't want you to be in that church either. God wants us to be real. Woe to you, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but, the inside, they are, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Polish up real nice on Sunday, but blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead, and everything unclean in the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness and by the way there were Pharisees and Sadducees the Sadducees ran the temple they hung around with the elite but the Pharisees had the heart of the everyday man the Pharisees had the ear of the nation Jesus Christ was taking on the most popular people and he was taking them on head-on and he was not being a people pleaser not because he was being a big deal, not because he wanted to show how rebellious it was, because, again, he loved them and knew their path was leading towards hell. If you and I are going to be people pleasers, we want everybody to think well of us, we're never going to tell them that they need a Savior. Let's love God and love other people enough to get out of our own comfort zone. We've got to. 
If we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to get out of our own comfort zone and start really loving people, caring about people. Uh, let me start again from verse 29. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build, <clears throat> you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. Why is this? Because in the Old Testament, all the good guys got killed, you know. Uh, the people were always killing the prophets. The prophets were always being, being uh, beat up and chased down and murdered. And so now, in the time of Jesus, they're building these beautiful tombs and saying, this is the tomb for this prophet and the tomb for this king. And they're, they're pretending like they're honoring all these great prophets of the past. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors back hundreds or thousands of years ago, we would not have taken part in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. We're not like them. It'd be different. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of, of the sin of your ancestors. Fill it up. Prove how unworthy you are, Jesus is saying. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? And I don't care what false teacher stands in front of you and says everybody goes to heaven. I've got a different teacher. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and sages. Therefore, I am sending you. Again, God keeps sending, and people keep killing. In our culture, we just ignore them or, or mock them or deride them. God keeps sending people. God keeps sending people. Therefore, because I love you, I'm going to send more people, even though you killed those. Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue them from town to town. This is exactly what they did to the early church. Exactly. And so, upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Baruch. You know... It didn't have to say A to Z. Isn't that funny? Isn't that just a weird coincidence? Yeah, all the righteous blood, A to Z, whom you murdered between the temple and in the altar. Truly, I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Proof true. Jesus Christ was killed. Stephen was killed. And then the church was uh, harshly attacked wherever they went. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Listen to this. Look at verse 37, please. Whoa, 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 whoa. And then God says, but I'm still going to send you people. Now listen to what Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Here, see here the pain in his voice? He says it twice, this city, Jerusalem, city of peace. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, my, my messengers, and you stole those that I sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Isn't that a good Mother's Day verse? God says, you're breaking my heart. I keep sending you people. I want you in heaven, and you kill the people I send you. You mock the people I send you. You ignore the people I send you. I, I, just, you, I just want to gather you under my wings and protect you and love you, and you keep attacking everybody I send you. Look, look, your house is desolate. Can't you see what's happened to society? Can't you look around you? Your house is desolate. It's empty. There is no purpose. There's no meaning. There's only destruction awaiting you. Look, your house is empty. For I tell you, Jesus says, you're not going to see me again. You will not see me, the Savior, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is Jesus Christ. Blessed is the Messiah. Blessed is the Savior. And that's the attitude you're going to have to have before you ever see Jesus. I'm going to recap now. Go through these lists, well, this list one more time. A little slower. The eight woes, the things that God hates and that moms don't want their kids to grow up and have. In this list, we see that God, uh, we see what God doesn't like about uh, man made pride. And it begins with practicing your faith in such a way that actually keeps other people from knowing God. And I want you to think about that. Am I somebody who's really hard to be around, but I've got a Jesus Christ, praise Jesus bumper sticker on my car? Am I somebody who's always cutting people down, I'm always gossiping, 
I'm the I, I'm a lazy worker. I'm 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 somebody who's not worth much at work, and I'm making enemies everywhere I go. And all the people hear me say is praise God, hallelujah. Do you think that makes Jesus attractive? And do you think God is happy with you driving people away from him? Think about it. Matthew 23, 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the door of the kingdom of God in people's faces. You're not going there yourselves, and you don't even allow other people to get in. Let's not live our lives. Let's not miss it and live our faith in such a way that drives people away from Jesus. The second thing that God hates about man-made religion is when people use religiosity to sucker widows and vulnerable people out of their very homes. I want to think more about, uh, think, think of some of the more notorious evangelists. Just because a guy's on TV doesn't mean he's a televangelist in this negative sense. But there, but there have been guys on television, we know that there were guys on television uh, who plotted together with their friends and said, I'm going to be religious and make a lot of money. And then they did it. And foolish people, desperate people, hurting people, signed them checks and sent it in. And I've been so angry sometimes watching those things. I, I raged. I wanted to break my television. I wanted to reach through my television, grab a hold of that person, because the way they're acting is driving. All, so many people look at the television and say, well, that's Christianity, and I don't want that. How do you think God feels about that? Those hucksters there ripping people off in the name of Jesus. And how do you think it's going to go for them on Judgment Day? Jesus tells us that their punishment is actually going to be more severe. I want to take a quick side note. It's very likely that verse 14, uh, it may or may not be in your Bible. And there's a reason for that. And if you're wondering why, we're going to just take a quick rabbit trail to explain that. Uh, it's very likely that verse 14 was not part of Matthew's original text. Well, then what does that mean? We only have seven instead of eight woes? What, what is Pastor talking about? And, and maybe you're thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to decide which verses count or which verses don't count, so I'm going to take all of them. And my question to you is, all of them from which age? Because the oldest versions of Matthew don't have verse 14. So you're going to just take the ones that added in later? It's unlikely that verse 14 was part of Matthew's original text. And I, for one, am so thankful that Christian scholarship is honest. We note when there's a difficulty with the text. That makes me have more confidence in the text. Because guess what? With all the, uh, with all the tens of thousands of manuscripts we have, all the people pouring over them continually, all you can find, most of the differences are in spelling, grammar, or a few texts that have been inserted or taken apart or we don't know where they're at in the text. The vast majority, like 99% of the, of the text, was rock solid, and none of the teachings of Christianity are in doubt. All the teachings that are here, we all know, this is what first century Christians taught because we have their letters talking about and quoting from the letters even before the Bible was brought together a couple hundred years together in one place. They're still quoting from these letters that were Book of Matthew that were being passed around, etc. This is rock solid, and it doesn't diminish the, the confidence we have in Scripture when we point out that, you know what, verse 14, the reason why it might be in some translations and not in other translations is because scholars have a lot of doubt it was there originally. And that doesn't bother me whatsoever. In fact, it gives me more confidence in the Bible. Now, but it gets more interesting than that. The oldest texts don't have verse 14. So this is one of those famous corruptions of the text. You know, that modern people say, well, the, the Bible's corrupt, so I can't believe it. And if the Bible is, if 14 is inserted, then I'm not going to believe any of it whatsoever. Okay. <coughs> Later texts have portions of 14 following directly after verse 12. Uh, some of them have a right word is here, but only quote a portion of it right after verse 13, but not the full text. Later texts of Matthew have the full text of verse 14 the way we have it today. So where did verse 14 come from? Mark and Luke, exactly. Isn't that easy? Isn't that cool? It comes right when Jesus, given the same sermon in another place, he says these things. Matthew apparently didn't write it down, or it was written down and lost right away. And so we don't have an old enough record of Matthew. And then it was added back in later, probably by some scribe who said, maybe they did it on purpose, saying, boy, this is over here in Mark and Luke. And by the, and by, by the way, the, 
text in Mark and Luke is not in doubt because that's in the old texts. So, so scribes either added it in on purpose or mistake because they're just writing down what they know and they just quote directly from the, from the other passage. So, so this error, this so-called error, is the original words of Jesus Christ found in other portions of Scripture, just not originally here. And that's why your Bible may or may not have that text. comes right out of Mark and Luke. Luke, it was edited in when they were transcribing the book of Matthew, uh, many thousand, uh, you know, uh, right there at the beginning of the church. The third woe, then, is Matthew 23.15. Matthew 23.15. And I took that rabbit trail because I have utter confidence in this book. I want you to know you can have confidence in it, too. Great minds have dissected it, taken it apart, and it is rock solid. Uh, the third woe, Matthew 23.15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he be, uh, becomes one, you make him twice as much of a son of hell as yourselves. There's an interesting dynamic going on here, for good or bad. A lot of time, recent converts are your very, very best evangelists. Recent convents, converts, not convents, that's a different word. Uh, recent converts are very passionate because they were going life in one direction, they've seen the light, they've turned and gone in another direction. So even a convert for atheism or Islam or a convert for a new convert for a new political party, or whatever you're converted to, you're really excited about it. And so you want to share that with other people. It happens in the church too for good. Uh, a lot of times new Christians uh, are wanting to get out there and share the message of Jesus Christ. Look what he's done in my life with other people. And by the way, Christians, don't shut down the new believer. It should motivate you to get off of your butt and start telling people about Jesus. If you've known Jesus a long time, that should just be more motivation to share that with other people. But here we have Jesus saying that these new converts to Judaism, to this pharisaical way of thinking, are twice as much. They're really sold out. They're passionate about, uh, about this pharisaical way of life. Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr, that was his name, observed that the Jewish proselytes, this, is a, this, uh, this quote here is ancient. It's almost as old as the New Testament. Justin Martyr observed that the Jewish proselytes did not only disbelieve the doctrine of Christ, but were abundantly more blasphemous against Christ than the Jews themselves. So these Gentile believers, that these Gentiles that came to the Pharisees for teaching, were greater enemies to the early church than the Jews themselves. They were against, uh, more blasphemy against Jesus than the Jews themselves, endeavoring to torment and cut off the Christian community wherever they could, they being in this the instruments of the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, another rabbit trail, but Justin Martyr, this is Mother's Day, Mom didn't name her child Martyr. That was a name given to him after the fact, after he got martyred. So he didn't grow up with this over his head. I'm Justin. What's your name? Justin Martyr. Oh, wow. Uh, you've got trouble coming. Uh, he was born where the church was born. He was born in Judea to a Greek, a mixed family of Greeks and Romans. It was a pagan family around the year 100 A.D. So just about the time that the book of Revelation is being, uh, has just finished up, about 30 years after Rome had been destroyed, uh, not Rome, uh, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Roman Empire, Herod's great temple, remember that wonder of the world was destroyed because the Romans didn't want the Jews coming and rallying around this great, tremendous building. So about 30 years after that, Christianity is still new. And here is this fellow named Justin who becomes a Christian, Greek, Roman, Latin fella. He was a philosopher. He was brilliant. And he wrote several books. We still have two of his books today, written right after the time of Christianity, right in this first, second, third generation of Christians. He was alive during the time when people who studied from the apostles themselves were still alive. He was a philosopher. He wrote several books defending Christianity. His most famous book, he wrote to the emperor of Rome, explaining why Christians are not bad. They actually live good moral lives and should not be put to death. Apparently, he may have been a good philosopher, but he was not a very successful one because the emperor had his head cut off in Rome. But uh, your buddy Justin is up in heaven today, fellow believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, and he says, 
Just like Jesus said, Jesus Christ prophesied that the followers of the, of the uh, Pharisees were going to be hard on, on true believers, and that's exactly, Justin reports is exactly what happened. The fourth woe from Matthew 23, 16 through 17 says, Woe to you, blind guides. You say, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. Whoever swears by the gold of the temple, that is obligated. You fools, you blind men. What is more important, the gold of the temple, of the gold? Uh, this is playing games with religion, isn't it? Why did they even think that holy God in heaven would look down at that kind of game playing? Well, you promised you'd do it, but you didn't promise by the gold of the temple, so therefore you can break your promise. What? Looking, looking for ways to, to... God says, don't lie. Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. If you say it, you don't have to say, I swear. If you're a follower of Jesus, what you say ought to be true. Amen? Don't play games with religion. And they're probably being superstitious as well, as if the gold had some supernatural, uh, magical effect to it. Moms, don't raise your kids to be superstitious twits. Uh, don't, moms, don't let your children grow up and not take Jesus Christ seriously. The fifth thing that Christ takes the Pharisees on for is having a strict obedience to the letter of the law, but having no heart for the spirit of the law. Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe on the spices and have neglect for the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness, but these are the things you should have done without neglecting the tithing as well. It's possible to really strictly obey God's law and not have a heart for God or other people. The sixth thing that Jesus warns against, and Parents, we want to raise our kids to grow up to be lovers of God, not people who just put on Christian clothes, sing Christian songs, and act Christian. We want them to actually love Christ and love other people. Otherwise, we're raising people who play games with religion, little Pharisees. The sixth thing Jesus warns against, and so we need to guard against in our own lives, and parents, we need to guard against in our children's lives, is to look good on the outside, but be really different people on the inside. Uh, are you a good chameleon? Do you know that there's actually a spiritual gift? <coughs> a missionary gift. People who often understand other people well, understand the way they talk, understand their culture, can fit in easy, easily. Any gift God's given you can also be used by the devil for evil. And you might have a really good gift at being able to communicate with people and fit in. Guess what? The devil's going to make try to use that so you just... You're a chameleon. You're one kind of person with one group of friends, another kind of person with another group of friends, another kind of group with the people at work, at the people at school, and you're not consistent anywhere at all. Big surprise, God's not a big fan of that. Be the same person everywhere you go. The sixth warning is similar. Jesus gives the ultimate insult in, in Jewish culture in the Old Testament. Touching something dead made you ritually unclean. You couldn't even go into the temple without going through a purification process. And Christ tells them, the Pharisees, the great religious teachers, you guys have dead things on the inside of you. You guys are dead on the inside. There's no spiritual life at all. Do you want God to look down at heaven and say, Foundation Bible Church, dead stuff in there? Why would Christ be so hard on them? Why, why is Jesus, I thought Jesus was love. I thought Jesus cared. Why is he, why is he attacking? They're, they're doing their best. They're religious. They're passionate about their religion. In America, don't we say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're be passionate about it? Parents, those of you that have sleeping teenagers in uh, Megachia Aiko, I totally don't mean you guys. Sometimes it's hard to get sleeping teenagers to wake up. Sometimes. In theory, right? And sometimes people are sleepwalking on their way to hell and they're not easily awoken with gentle words and hugs. Gentle words and hugs doesn't always get people out of bed. Gentle words and hugs don't always get unsaved people to see that they need a savior. Sometimes what somebody needs is to be shaken awake 
And Jesus Christ is doing a whole lot of shaking because he cares and he loves. And he's not going to let the Pharisees go easily. And so he's saying, you guys are doomed, you're doomed, you're doomed. And what you're doing is doing, dooming other people, and you've got to wake up. And then he says, and I'm going to send you more people. And oh, I just, I just yearn to gather you under my wings. I love you. I want to protect you. I want you to be my children. I want you to be with me. Woe to you. Final warning is also prophecy about the Pharisees, what the Pharisees will do to not only Jesus, but his followers in Matthew 23, 29 through 35. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets, you adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we'd been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in the shedding of blood. But Jesus says, you're testifying against yourself because you are going to kill me and kill my followers. You're going to persecute them. You're going to shake, sh uh, chase them from town to town. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you going to escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, I'm going to send you more people. You're going to abuse those, but I'm going to keep sending them because I keep loving you. And if you kill them, my guys are okay. And hopefully, they'll get through to some of you. The guilt of the righteous blood is on your hands. It will fall on you. Last thought, again. Again, moms, dads, children, uh, why does Jesus, we're, we're studying Jesus, we're studying the book of Matthew so we can fall in love with Jesus. Jesus is a hard man. He's hard. He's not a sissy. He's not the blow-dry Jesus that we see in today's culture. He's taking on the powers that be. He's saying unpopular things. He knows he's going to get killed, and he's doing this because he cares so much about people, and he loves people and wants people to be with him. Brothers and sisters, do we love? Do we love enough to say unpopular things? Do we love enough to be mocked? Do we love enough for, for other people to reject us? Do we love them more than we love our own comfort zones? Here's a hint. Why does Jesus say unpopular things? Why did Jesus get so hacked off? Well, just like your mama, who got mad when you did bad things, only to a much greater degree, God knows that if we keep down this path, we're headed for destruction. We're going to grow up, we're going to be nasty people, and then we're going to go to eternal separation from God. And God doesn't want that. God wants you in heaven. God wants you forgiven. God wants you walking in a new life, just like parents want their kids to grow up and be good. God wants his children to grow up and be his children, be his family and, and good, and God knows what's best more than we could possibly know for ourselves. God wants you forever. He doesn't get bored with you. He doesn't get tired of you. He doesn't throw you out with yesterday's garbage. God wants you forever, and he hates anything in your life or in this culture that could take us away from him. He hates it, he absolutely despises it. Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those that I send to you, how often I've wanted to gather your children together the way a hen, a mother hen, gathers her chicks under her wings. And then listen to these tragic words, but you were unwilling. Don't be unwilling. Jesus is calling today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Don't let anything get in the way between you and Jesus. That's the most important thing you can do in this life, more than where you live, more than who you marry. The most important thing you can do in your life is to get right with God and start walking with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you care enough about us that you got ticked off. You got ticked off at man-made religion that drags us away from you, that keeps other people from knowing you. And Lord God, at the church of Christ today, we want to repent that so often we're so hypocritical, we're so self-righteous, we're so critical, we're... We're so holier than thou. We're, we're, we use religion to build ourselves up, Lord, to such an extent that we drive people away from you, Lord. Lord, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be like that. Fill us up with love, Lord God, and help us to raise kids that really love other people. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being patient with us. Help us to be the same with everyone around us, Lord. And God, bless the moms. They've got a big job. Amen.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.